Good morning. Good to have everybody here. Thank you for those joining us online. Uh, did you know that within the first year, 70% of all lottery winners go broke? It's true. Here's my question. Why do most go broke when they've come into more money than they've ever had before? Why do they find themselves in positions where they had everything they thought they ever wanted, and now that they have it, they're unable to hold it? Um, I would contend it's because they do not know how to handle their newfound success. That is the danger. Any level of success has an ability to be dangerous. See, here's what I want you to walk out with today. God doesn't just want you to succeed. He wants you to know how to sustain success. That's why he prepares you. Sometimes I'll have people come to me and say, Pastor, would you pray for me that God would deliver me from this struggle that I have? And I would say, sure, I'll pray, but I'm not sure it's going to work that way. Because if all I do is pray and everything changes... You no longer have a desire to do the thing that you don't want to do anymore. How are you going to be able to hold on to that success? Because in my mind, the reason you do what you do anyway is because you're trying to heal this part of your heart that's not healed. And you found something that helps, but it doesn't heal. So you find yourself consistently going back to it over and over and over again. So my, my contention would be this. If we prayed whatever that habit is away, that if you don't deal with the heart, you'll find a new habit to make that feel better. Because that's how we operate. We're looking for ways to take care of ourselves. And, and here's the thing. When you come into the equation with the Lord, what causes you to succeed in one season may not be the same thing that's going to help you succeed in the next. Because here's what we need to understand with God. His purpose is not to accomplish a lot of things. God is not like the American God that we make him out to be, that he's always seeking to achieve and, and, and move forward and do things. His purpose is relationship with you. Meaning he wants you to have a dependence upon him that causes you to draw close to him, to need him. So he's never going to give you the key to all consistent forever success. Like he's going to consistently require you to do things that draw you back to him. And that's what I want us to look at today is um, what, what, what helps us to move into this. Today we're going to see a path from Joshua on how do we sustain success? How do we not just achieve something? But how do we hold on to it? And how do we move forward in that consistently? I think there's a lot we can learn from Joshua today. We're back to week eight of It's in the Middle. If you remember the last time I spoke, I only got through half of it. So we, we said we'll finish it up today. So this is uh, part two of the message we titled, Taking What God Has Given. And that's not like a bad thing, like, oh, I'm just going to take it because God's given it to me, giving it to me good this time, like it ain't good. Like I'm talking about that God can give you something, but you still got to take it. Right. God can give you the victory. He can give you freedom. He can give you salvation. But you still got to step into it and receive it and hold on to it. And so like everybody in this room, you have victory. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have victory over the sin in your life. You, you're not a curse of that any longer. You're not a slave to your sin any longer. That's completely been broken. But how many understand, because sometimes we've learned to live like slaves, we still think like slaves, though you're no longer a slave. And that, that is what I believe God wants to help us see today, is how do I grab hold of what he's already given me so I can live in sustained success? So to do that, we're going to be looking again at, at Joshua chapter 6. And I want to read this verse, Just I'm, I'm going to recap real quick, and then we'll get into the meat of what I want to get you through today. Uh, chapter 6, verse 2, then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Pay attention to what God says here. I have delivered. Like he's already talking with certainty, with an uncertain type situation. The walls are still up. The enemy is still looking down at the Israelites from their walls, taunting and saying, come get us. And God looks at this people and says, I have delivered them. You already have this victory. 
God's speaking with complete certainty in a very uncertain type situation. That, that's how God works, is though to the outside world, everything at the moment seems uncertain. God speaks with certainty. Here's the question. Whose voice do you listen to? The one that says, what if, or what's going to happen? Or the one who speaks with clarity and certainty and lets you know, I am with you. I am going to deliver you. I am going to walk you through this situation. You will not go through this by yourself. See, that, that's what God is, is, is speaking to Joshua. He says, I've given you this. You already are ready to take it. And so what we've got to remember is everything up to this point has all been preparation for this day. When they came to the Jordan and it was flooding, the purpose of the Jordan was not just so they could accomplish another thing. It was so they could begin to put their faith and their trust in God, even when they don't see the results in front of them, that they would be willing to step out in obedience because obedience is really the key. Will you follow me into the flooded waters, even though the waters haven't moved yet? Because if you'll follow me here, there's going to come a day you're going to stand in front of some massive walls. And I'm going to tell you to fight a different kind of battle than you've ever fought before. And if you can't follow me here, you're not going to be able to follow me there. Because in this place, it's just the water. In that place, there's walls and there's warriors looking to take you out. See, he's building them up. He's preparing them. He's getting them ready. That's why I would caution some of you in the struggle you're in right now. Don't ask God to deliver you from something that might be intended to develop you. And the only way you're going to know which is which is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who shows you and guides you and directs you. And can we just be real about it? Sometimes God don't tell. Sometimes he just wonders, are you willing to stay faithful in the season, in the situation that you're in, even if you don't know where the outcome is? God leads you into that for a reason, because he's trying to build something in you and prepare you for something like these guys. So, so anyway, Joshua, you've got this battle. Let me tell you how you're going to win it. And I'll just summarize this real quick for the sake of time. Here's what you're going to do. Every day, you're going to get up in the morning. You're going to stir up the band because, you know, let's send the band out to war. That's a great idea. Uh, not only that, the preachers are going with you. Preachers don't go to war. They stay back home and pray that you win the war. But your preachers are going. We're going to put the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to put fighting men in the front, fighting men in the back, the band, and then the preachers, and then let's go. And you're going to march around the city, and you're not going to say a word one time every day. That sounds like a great plan, God. Let's do it. I really feel like we're going to win this battle. How many understand the worst strategy ever? Right? Because think about it. They just overcame. They just came through the Jordan. They just went through a situation where God called them to obedience, where they consecrated themselves back to God. They reminded themselves that he is God and we are his people. Like they are fired up and they are ready to go. And Joshua says for six days we're going to march around this place. For six days, we're going to walk around these really, really big walls that they say were so big, chariots would race on top of them. How cool of an idea is that? For six days, you're going to see, like, you ever look at something from a distance and you go, well, that's not that big. And then you get close to it and you're like, that is massive. Oh, for six days, all your army is going to walk around the walls going, those are really big. And for six days, they're going to listen to the enemy talk trash the whole time, saying, you guys are idiots. What are you doing? Like, maybe these guys aren't these fierce warriors that we once thought they were. For six days, this is what you're going to do. This is what God is calling them to do. But there was something that I saw as I went through that, that that I think is really important. If you pay attention to that whole situation, you see you've got the fighting men in the front, the fighting men in the back. You have the band, but then you also have the Ark of the Covenant and the priests. And where are they? In the middle. That's the whole reason of this series is where is God in our situation? In the middle of it. He's not waiting off in a distance saying, come on, if, when you finally get it right and get over here, I'll, I'll help you. He's not saying, like, like, sometimes we believe theology that isn't theology, right? Some, have you ever heard it said, God helps those that helps themselves? Anybody ever? That's not biblical. Because out of the pit I was in, I couldn't get out on my own. He had to rescue me, right? And so, so here's the whole mindset is God saying, I will be in the middle of the situation with you. 
So wherever you're at this morning, whatever your struggle is, here's what you need to know. God is in the middle of it with you. His presence is there. He is right there, parked himself in the center of your situation, and he has no plans on leaving you, abandoning you, or walking away from you. Doesn't mean it ain't going to be at times where you're going to feel like you're alone. It's hard to feel God when things are hard. It's hard to sense God when things feel like they're not right and they're not lining up. But I'm telling you this morning, wherever you're at, whatever your situation is, God is in the middle of it, just like he shows us here. So anyway, we go through this whole scenario and we see God right there in the middle. And and you have to imagine that at times they would come back to camp. I mean, come on, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, middle of the week. This is dumb. Why are we continuing to do this? How, what are, are we just going to like stomp enough that eventually the walls will just fall down? Like, what are we doing? This doesn't make sense. Y'all got to understand something. God will have you do things that do not make sense. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about the whole formula for success. We believe one plus one equals two, and it does. However, it doesn't always work that way with God. Sometimes he'll call you to do things that make no logical sense, and he, he's just looking for your obedience. He, he can make whatever what plus whatever equal whatever. You understand what I mean by that? We think, here's what we think. Like, God says, I'm going to do this with your life. I'm going to take you from here, and I'm going to take you over here. And we, in our minds, we go, yes. And we start coming up with our strategy of how to get from point A to point B. And God's like, oh, no, 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 no. See, point A is actually going to take you over here to point Z, and then we'll come back to point. Like, that's God. Why? Because he's developing you in that process. You think the destination is the goal for God. It's not. It's the development. He doesn't need us for his success. He doesn't need us to to do great things. He chooses to use us. He wants to partner with us. But he wants us to be completely dependent on him where our relationship with him is what leads and guides and directs us. Not our logic. Anybody ever struggle with God's illogic before? If not, how long you been following? Because if God is, if you've never been in a season or a situation where God has asked you to do something that made no sense, you need to step out more. For real. Because anytime you follow God for a minute, he is going to have you do things that make no sense. Because in those moments, he's building your faith. Will you trust me and trust my word over what you see? Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. He's not looking for the results. He's looking for your obedience. And that's what he's doing with this, these, these children of Israel. He's like, march around the city. One time every day, six days. However, on the seventh, you're going to go around seven times, right? On the Lord's day. Now, I talked about this the last time a little bit. Six is the number of man. Six was on the sixth day, man was created. On the seventh day, that's God's day. That's the Sabbath day. That's the day he rested. Here's what I saw. Here's what I see from this. God says, I'm going to let you expend yourself for six days. And in seven days, I'm going to require more of you because you're not going to have the strength to do it on your own. Now you have to rely on me. Here's the thing. Seven is going to be the day the walls come down, and I'm going to make you march seven times. So you're going to be even more tired than before. How many understand, not a good plan to tire yourself out when you've got a battle to fight. God was like, look, I don't need you to fight this battle. I've already done the battle. I just need you to obey me. So seven times you're going to march around these walls, and on the seventh time coming around, you're going to have the band blow their trumpets, and you're finally going to shout, and the walls are all coming down. And that's exactly what happened. That's what we see take place in this scenario. Joshua 6.20. I'm skipping around a little bit, so just roll with me. 6.20, it says, 
No, I have to find it. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged up straight in, and they took the city. They took the city. But in Joshua 6-2, the reason they took the city was because God already gave them the city in Joshua 6-2. Remember, when Joshua was being told about the promised land, God said to Joshua, every piece of ground your feet shall walk on inside the boundary that I've given you is yours to take. That's important. I've grown up in church. Come on, Pastor Christine, Jericho marches. We're going to Jericho march around this city. We're going to believe in every piece of ground. Anybody ever been in a Jericho march before? Okay, let's be honest about something. You don't get to walk anywhere and everywhere and expect that's your place. God told Joshua, every piece of ground you walk on inside the boundaries that I have given you will be yours. I have given you authority for this place. That's where you get to walk. Don't step into places that don't belong to you because you're going to get beat up and run out the house bloody and naked like the seven sons of Sceva. That's another story. Look it up and Google it. It's kind of funny. Um, but that, hear me. God says, I've given you this, and you're going to step into it. God gave them the victory, and they received the victory in 620. That's why I'm telling you, you've got to take what God has already given you. God gave it to you. That means it's yours, but you still got to take it. You still got to move in obedience and receive what God has given you. It doesn't just come free. It doesn't just because God gave it to you. It doesn't mean like it just comes in this pretty little package and you ain't got to work for it. Here's why. Just like our lottery winners. If you don't know how to make money, you don't know how to hold money. If you don't know how to live in success, you're not going to know how to keep success. If God just gave it to you, you're not, no, you're not gonna know how to go through the next battle or the next situation. Just like you would with your own kids, you're trying to develop them to succeed in life. Meaning if you give them everything they want from this big, how many understand that kid's gonna be messed up? Because they don't understand no. They don't understand how to be disappointed. Right? God's trying to do the same thing with his kids, saying, I'm going to give you this land, but you're going to learn how to take it first. So they took the city because in Joshua 6, 2, God gave it to them. It's with all the victories in our walk with Jesus. God gives it to us through our victory in Christ, but we must take hold of it. You have victory over your past. But how many know sometimes we can still be a slave to the old thinking and the old ways of life. Though those don't have hold on you anymore, but you've got to take it. Just because God set you free from it doesn't mean it doesn't hold on to you sometimes still. You've got to grab hold of it. You've got to start retraining your mind and thinking of yourself differently. Listen, maybe you were raised in the church where you were taught you were just some old dirty sinner saved by grace. That's bad theology. You are not some old, dirty sinner. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus if you've said yes to Jesus. There is no blemish on you anymore. There is no stain. You're not trying to be a better person. You were made right with God when you said yes to Jesus. You just now have to live in that mindset. Because though you are right with God, your mind still thinks like the old person. And that's what God is saying. He's like, look, I gave you freedom from your past, but you got to walk in it. You got to step out. You've got to take the next steps to not think like the person you used to be. Same with, uh, with, with the sin in our life that we feel like we can't overcome. I'm just a bound to the sin. It's just my cross to bear. There is no sin, according to Scripture, that has overtaken you. Nothing. Nothing. You may struggle, but you're not a slave to that sin any longer. The Bible says Jesus completely set you free. And whom the Son set free is free indeed. There is no bondage on you. You may continue to return to bondage, but you choose to go back there. It's not that it still holds you. If we were slaves to sin, we would spend our whole life fighting sin. Your purpose in life is not to fight sin. It is to reflect him. Some of you, you spend so much time and energy, I'm trying to be good. I'm, you're not good. 
Neither am I. That was never the goal to be good. My goal was to imitate him, right? It isn't to try and change my behavior. It's to let him transform my heart so I can reflect the image of the one who has called me. That's what God's trying to do here. He's saying, look, I've already given you many victories in your life, but y'all got to take it. Same with addiction, right? You feel like, well, it's just, it just controls me. I just can't get free from it. You have freedom. The Bible says you do. Like, this isn't a joke. Now, here's the thing. The reason most likely you keep going back is because of what it gives you, not because you can't let go of it. Because you're still trying to heal this broken heart of yours and you found something that gives you a momentary reprieve from the pain that you feel. And God's like, if you'll let me come in, I'll restore your heart so you don't have to keep turning to this, that, and the other to try and be okay with who you are. You have it. you got to step into it. you got to receive it and begin to move forward in it. Same with salvation. Salvation is free. There's nothing we can do to earn it. But we got to take some steps to let that salvation become the reality of our life. Because there's some of us, we've said a prayer just to get our fire insurance, if we're honest about it. Our goal is just to not go to hell. And yet some of you, you live this hell on earth that makes me scratch my head and going like, why? Because salvation wasn't just something that you're supposed to have when this life is over. Salvation is your, your gift for this whole existence. That's why Paul talked about, I move from glory to glory to glory. And some of y'all, y'all living like, like I'm, just, I'm just holding on. Like, man, I hated sometimes hanging out with some of the old timers in the church who talked about, we're just holding on. Oh, when the sweet by and by comes. We'll be taken out of this horrible world. Like, you, you can hear it sometimes, man. They start talking like, oh, just can't wait till Jesus comes back because this world is going straight to hell in a handbasket. Then do something about it. It's your, it happened on your watch. Do something. Don't talk about it. Go do something about it. If God has called you, if he saved you, then he gave you this gospel of reconciliation to reconcile others back to himself. Then stop telling me how bad it is and go do something about it. That's why we talk here about our other six days. I, I don't look good. You made it to church. Gold star. Give them a gold star. Every one of them that walks out. Get a little. I'm going to get you all little stickers. I went to church just like you voted. I could care less. Did that little time on a Sunday translate to you living different on Monday? That's what matters here. If it doesn't, you can have your sticker. <laughs> They'll burn up too. For real, like, do something. God gave us this victory. Let's live in it. Now, verse 21, I touched on this the last time. I'm going to hit it again because I think we've got to sometimes talk about some of the difficult things in the Bible. The Bible says in verse 21, they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkey. That's a hard verse. It's one of those moments where it's difficult to understand God. And I'm not going to pretend to say, oh, this is why. Why did God tell them to commit genocide? I don't know. He's God, I'm not. Are there things I don't completely understand? There are. If I understood it all, I'm not sure this would be divine. I think it would be man-made because it would all make sense. It doesn't make sense. There's a few things that do make sense to me. Um, the first is the sin of these Canaanites was pretty hor horrendous. The greatest sin was the sin of how they worshiped this God called Moloch. Okay, now this is what was said of that, that when you worship the God Moloch, you had to make your children pass through the fire. Meaning they would sacrifice their own children to appease this God. We're not talking about they're worshiping a tree or the sky or the sun. We're saying they're worshiping some deity that drives them to kill their own offspring. 
I don't know about you, that sounds pretty demonic to me. Right? Tree huggers, they're weird, but yeah. We're talking about you killed your own kid to appease some deity. In Deuteronomy, God spoke to them before they even came into this place and said, when you come into this land, you will drive everything else out. I don't want you mixing with their religion because if you allow that into your life, it's going to become corrupted and you're going to eventually be led away from me. Now, but I I don't think it's just that because you see, let's read on for a second. So we pointed that out. And then verse 22, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with the oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. So here we see all the city is being destroyed, but Rahab and all her family are saved. Why? Because Rahab had faith. Rahab believed. And her belief led her to action. We also know that the entire city of Jericho believed in God. Because the Bible says, when we read earlier, that when they heard they had crossed the Jordan, their hearts melted inside of them and they lost the desire to fight. Because they knew and heard of what their God had done. Here's what I would contest. If this city would have repented and said, your God is God and ours is not, and we will follow, I believe they would have been spared, just like Rahab was. See, Rahab was spared, not because she heard the stories and believed, but if you remember, she hid the spies, knowing that could have cost her her life because she trusted more in the God above than what her king could do to her regardless. So so what I think we just see here is an example that faith is not just a belief because the Bible says you believe in God, good. Even the demons believe in God. At least they shudder a little bit. Right? Some of us, we believe in God, but we live our life however we want, and we don't even shake about it. The Bible says the demons at least shake a little bit because they believe in God, because there's a fear and an understanding of his awesome and authority. So what I see here is is the reason maybe what we're seeing take place was they knew that God was God because they had heard and they had seen and they believed, but they did nothing about it. And the reason Rahab was saved, and Joshua will say, well, it's because, later in the book he'll say, well, it's because you hid the spies. I would contend it's not just hiding the spies. It's because she obeyed and was willing to put her trust in him, regardless of what could happen to her in the situation. So we see this take place here, and Rahab and her family are completely spared and like I said, man, it's not enough to believe, is, believe there is a God. That belief must lead you to making him your God. And that's what Rahab did. We see that in verse 26 at 7. At this time, Joshua pronounced the solemn oath, uh, cursed be the Lord, or excuse me, cursed before the Lord is anyone who undertakes to rebuild the city of Jericho at the cost of his firstborn son. He will lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the entire land. I want to now get into the main part of this. Verse 2 said, I've delivered. Verse 20 says, they took it. I want to talk about the formula or the pattern I see that allowed for this to take place. And I believe it's the same with all of our victories when it comes to Christ. There's a pattern, right? There's something. Now, I, I don't look for like, do this, this, and this, because that's what man wants. We look I hope I can explain this correctly without making too mad, many people mad. We, we want faith. We want success. But we want predictable success. Right? It's, it's, to me, it's the problem with the church today. We've learned how to do church without God. We can grow churches without God. 
We know how to, we know people well enough to do certain things, to create certain programs. And, and I'm not putting down anybody. Look, if your church does it this way, we trust that that's what the Lord called them to do. But I've been to enough church conferences and seminars to know here's how you build a church. You get everybody involved in some type of social thing, right? So that way they make friends. And now that everybody has friends, they're going to keep coming to church. And then on top of that, you get everybody to serve. So I need you to serve. I need you to do something. I need you to, we just create all these serving opportunities. And, and, and if you do all that, you're going to be able to get their nickels and their noses. And that's what matters. And that's how, Pastor, you know if you've been successful or not. Tell me how many noses are in your church. Talk to me about the nickels you made. That's how we determine what success is. Here's my struggle. I can do all those things without being led by the Holy Spirit. I know how to build the programs and the systems to make it go. But I don't know that's what I see God doing. And that's part of why I've been in this series is because I'm just wondering if he hasn't disrupted us because what we have built for him in our image, for our egos and our success to make us feel good, if he's not going, I'm done with it. If you want to if you want to move with me, follow me. So here to me, this is are y'all right? Like we OK? OK. You send the emails later. Uh, faith. Number one, the first thing this requires for not just success, but sustained success, faith. Joshua and Israel, they had to believe the battle plan. The battle plan didn't make sense. Faith is always required. It's always the first step. Your salvation will require faith. Do you believe he is God? That he died on a cross and he rose from the dead to forgive you of all your sins, no matter what you've done. Not just what you did in your past, but what you're doing today and what you'll even do in your future. Do you believe? If you believe, it, that's the first step. It always requires faith. That faith was being developed all the way back at the Jordan. Will you step into a flooded water before you see the waters subside? Will you follow me even when it doesn't make sense? Even when it may even look a little bit dangerous? Will you trust me and my word over what you see? Again, without faith, it's impossible to please him. He says that. Faith. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could look at that mountain and tell it to jump into the water, and it would. That's what Jesus said. Faith. Your middle, most likely, is where God is building preparation, and in that preparation, he's building your faith. You want to see God do great things in your life, but the greater the call on your life, the greater the faith in your life must be. Because he will call you to do things. God doesn't, he doesn't normally lay it all out in front of you and it all works. Like, he doesn't just give you the money and say, okay, go do it. You typically have to believe for it. And for those who've ever done it a lot, you find out sometimes you're waiting till the midnight hour for the money to come in for the situation to change, for the waters to subside. So the first thing that's required is faith, but it can't stop there. There's another step that has to, see, to be taken, and that's what Joshua did. The second was this, obedience. You believe, good. How does that change how you live? How, how does that, how does it, what dynamic shifts because you believe? Obedience, Joshua and Israel, they follow the battle plan exactly. Joshua, I've given you this city. I believe you're going to take it. Yes, I will. Now, get all your army together and do power laps around the walls. Okay. That's the hard part. Because when he usually asks you to do something, it isn't going to make sense. I want you to do this. What? What? Why? That, that's, that doesn't make sense, God. Why would you ask me to do that? Because I want you to obey me. Because I've already given you the victory, but the victory will come my way and not yours. 
So put your sword down. You're not charging. You're not building ladders. You're not taking the walls down. Because when this is all said and done, only one person will get the glory in this, and it's me. Not because I don't want you to have the glory. Joshua was, the Bible says, famous. Because God was with him in everything he did. You'll still get a part of it, but it will be known that only God did this. It was not by my, nor by power, but by my spirit, declares the Lord. I did this. You, I, he doesn't share that, that, that glory with others. Again, the Jordan was a practice step. Do what I say. And if you remember when they were at the Jordan, they stepped in even when they did not know. Joshua said he got up that morning, and he had yet, God said, in three days, you're going over this water. The Bible says he got up that morning, and we hear no clear direction. As Joshua stepped into the water, God said, here's now what you're going to do. Obedience. He requires it. Will you obey me? Will you follow me? Gilgal was practice. Trust in me and not logic. Faith will always require a step of obedience. I don't believe it's faith unless it's coupled with obedience. You can believe and do nothing about it. Do you really believe? Right? Anybody ever do like uh, rock climbing or any kind of like zip lining or rappelling? They put this thing on you that feels really uncomfortable. And then they tie you to a rope and they have you stand at the edge of a cliff and they're like, jump off. I believe this is going to hold me. You don't believe until you step off. And you still don't believe until you're halfway down and go, ah, I guess I didn't die. That's good. Right? God's saying, look, it takes faith, but that faith will require obedience. It can't be faith if you're not willing to step out. It's just good thoughts. There's no action. Then there's another part. This is part three. It's going to take courage. Because typically what God's going to ask you to do is crazy. He's going to call you to do something. It's been my experience. Maybe it's different for you. I've never been asked to do something that I can do. If I can do it, I don't need him. It takes courage to step out into the unknown. It takes courage to follow the who and not the how. I'll say that again. It takes courage to follow the who and not the how. I'd much rather know the how because then I could determine with my logical brain whether that makes sense or not. You understand Joshua didn't get the how, he just got the who. Do what I say, and I'll deliver this. I'll bring you through this. I'm not going to tell you how. We talked about that even when the Israelites left Egypt. God says, I'm taking you from Egypt to the promised land. Hallelujah. Oh, he never tells you how you're going to get there. Some of y'all, you're like waiting, oh, God, just tell me what to do. He's like, this is what you're going to do. You're like, yes. But you, you, slow down, killer. You don't, he didn't tell you how he's going to get you to that place. Because <laughs> if he told you the how, you'd be like, thank you, no thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take you out of Egypt, and I'm taking you to a promised land. But for 40 years, you're going to walk in circles around a desert. Until I get your heart ready to take hold of what I promised you. Nope, Egypt is good for me. God knows you better than that to tell you how he's going to do it. Plus, if it's me and he tells me how, I'm 15 steps ahead of him. He is not looking for that. He is looking for obedience. Obedience means I have to slow down and follow him and not get ahead it means I need the Holy Spirit to quickly, I pray this prayer for myself daily, keep me on a short leash so I don't get too far away from you. Because sometimes when I get going, I'll just go. And sometimes when I'm struggling, I'll just stop. I need that short leash because if it's too long, I can wander too far away. And before long, I'm in places I didn't want to be. It's going to take courage. It takes courage to walk into battle, not knowing how, but simply knowing who you're following and trusting that to be enough. 
takes courage to walk into the unknown. It takes even more courage to step into the places where you failed. When God calls you to go back to the same place where you blew it and to step out again, that takes even more courage. Why would I go back there? We as humans do everything we can to avoid pain and discomfort and failure. See, here's why I have to go back there, because that was part of the development process. And if I don't step into that development, I can't go into the destiny, because if I don't get it right here, you saw it happen. They came to the promised land 40 years ago. Mom and dad were there. Grandma and grandpa were there. They sent spies into the land. Every spy came back saying, we are like grasshoppers and they are like giants. Only two came back with a good report. What did God say after that moment? You will wander this desert for 40 years until every one of you die off. And then I will raise up your children to take this place. What happened 40 years later? Same scenario. Promised land. Sent the spies in. Joshua was smart this time. I'm only sending two. And it's two that I already know have faith. I ain't sending any of them dummies anymore because I'm not wondering another 40 years. I ain't got 40 years. Some of y'all need to think about that. Think about this for a minute. You understand some of us, we're, we're at a place in life we won't have the years to make up the mistakes. That's why we need to stay real close to the Holy Spirit because if we mess it up, when, when you're young and dumb, you've got time. But as you get older, you don't have those years anymore to make up those mistakes why it's imperative you stay close to the Holy Spirit. It's going to take courage, especially when you step back into those places. The other thing we see with this, this group of people is this. So it takes faith, obedience, courage. But then it takes this word, this stinks. It's this word endurance. They followed this battle plan for a period of time, even when it seemed like it wasn't working. If this was the first time in a situation like this, it may have been overwhelming and too much, but they had already gone through it. See, your development is part of growing your endurance. How much can you endure? Because in the crucible, where God begins to break you and make you into the man or the woman he's called you to be, you're going to have to know how to endure because breaking hurts. And it isn't going to make sense, y'all. Like, 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 it sounds sexy sometimes. You're like, oh, God, just break. Like, we used to sing songs, just break me, Lord. You don't know what you're asking for. Because in our mind, it feels like that would be cool till it happens. Because when he's doing the breaking or allowing the breaking to take place, you fall into so many little pieces. You don't know you could ever put it back together. In fact, I don't think you ever go back together right. I feel like, like, like uh, Jacob who wrestled with God. After you go through a season like that, you limp for the rest of your life. You won't be the same because he didn't break you to just put you back the way you were. He broke you to, per, to, to reposition you into who he called you to be. It's only a broken vessel that he's able to use. He had to strengthen them through their struggles along the way. Maybe the, what you're going through right now is building the endurance to overcome the situations that are in front of you. That are even in your future because if you can't endure now, you're not going to make it then. He's building up the strength, the ability to endure. Endurance is something we don't see in our world much anymore because we don't suffer as much as we used to. Come on, think about it. And I'm not trying to be political, but we have a government that will not let us suffer. They will do everything they can to make it feel like we're going to be okay. They will bail. Look, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we went through a season like this. Businesses just closed. They didn't offer money to help you bail out. I'm not saying I'm, I'm mad about that. It's helped us quite a bit. But at the same time, we don't know how to suffer. And God's like, if you're going to do these great things that I've called you to do, you've got to know how to endure. Because there's going to be moments. Look, if Jesus himself bent over a pale Passover moon, praying his guts out. The Bible says blood started, sweat started to fall like drops of blood because he was in such anguish. And he looked up to heaven and said, if there's any other way, take it. I don't want to do it. Nevertheless, not your will, my will, but yours be done. If he didn't hold suffering back from his own son, what makes us think we'll be any different? See, sometimes I think when we go through the suffering, we're ready to quit. 
This shouldn't be this way. You don't know. Perseverance, the Bible says, must finish its work so that we might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I just wonder if we struggle with persevering. If we struggle with this idea of how to endure, how to hold on. When God takes you to the next step in your journey, sometimes there's going to come with suffering. And then the last point, this to me is how we sustain success, is dependence. Here we go. Faith. Joshua, do you believe? I believe. Obey. I obey. Do you have courage? Yep, I'll step into it. I'll do it. Can you endure? We'll keep marching. Let's go back before Jericho. On a hill, Joshua's sneaking out. He sees the angel of the Lord. And he says, are you for me or against me? The angel looks at him and says, I'm neither. As captain of the Lord of hosts, meaning Jesus, I have my own plan, my own agenda. Joshua, take off your shoes. Remember, we talked about that. What did that mean? I give you all authority. I give you all control. I give up my leadership. I can't lead this. You have to. Take off your shoes because the place you're standing is holy ground. Here's, here's the struggle. Come on up, Jason. Dependence. Israel didn't rely on worldly methods. Their trust was in the Lord, not in human ingenuity. Joshua fell before Jesus in that moment. I believe it's the exact reason why Jericho fell before Joshua. If the one didn't happen first, the other wasn't going to happen. Here's our problem, our struggle. Or let, let's not say ours. I'll just put it all on me. Here's my struggle. It starts with faith. Can God do something great? I believe he can. And we, we get excited because when God's using you and things are stirring and shifting, it's kind of cool. So, okay, Chris, then step out. I will. And you step out and you're excited. Man, you get really pumped up because when the journey starts, you're like, wow, walking with Jesus, you know, going to do cool things. Like, you just, you're hyped. And you keep walking and then you come to a place where you can't see the road anymore. Keep going. I can't see. Doesn't matter. Go anyway. Just follow me. If you'll follow me, I'll do greater things in your life than you can imagine. Follow. Okay. Follow. And you're walking in that. And it's hard because you can't see. But what you didn't know is like, it's not just hard. Like that, there was a bunch of mud. And it's like you're, you're just trudging. And you're trudging. Like, oh, this stinks. And you're like, God, are you sure? Like, I'm going the right direction? Because I think I probably should go someplace else. No, no, keep coming. Okay. You keep going. And then all of a sudden, you start to watch things happen. Because he rewards his obedience, right? Like, when you're faithful and you obey, he starts to reward all of a sudden, next, you start seeing things happen before you that you never thought would happen. That's cool. Like, the church is growing. And God's moving. And not only are we growing numerically, but our influence is growing exponentially outside of the building. You're watching lives be changed and hearts be transformed. Success. We're doing good. All right. I got it. I do this, I do this, I do this, and this happens. Done. And then God comes back in and goes, give it back to me. Now follow me over here. No, no, no. no. See, God, this is what works. One, two, three, four. We've seen it. Look, look around us. It's amazing. Uh-uh. That worked there. But now I'm taking you here. And what I called you to do there will not work over here. Here's what he's asking me to do. Give me back. Put your dependence back on me. It's, it, it's humility. It isn't me. I don't like it. 
and probably you don't either, because we want to know how to win. We want to know how to succeed. How many would like predictable success in your life? How many would like to know, do one, two, three, it works? I'm good with that. How many understand it gets really hard when you, what you know has worked in the past, he tells you to go a complete different way. Why is he asking me to do that? Because he needs my dependence to be on him and not my methods. That's what I would prefer. I, would, I like my formulas. I like my methods. I like my one, two, three, this is how it works. But he wants it to be follow me, follow him. That's how I sustain success. Where did success come from? From my formula? No, from him. How do I get success? Follow him. Do what he tells me to do, even if it makes no sense again. That's the scary part, because most of us, once we taste success, we don't want to go back to the mud. We don't want to go back to faith. We don't want to go back to uncertainty. We want to stay in places where we know we win. But then what happens is it becomes about me, and it becomes my thing. I'll close with this. There was a story when I was a little, not little, about 12, 13, there was this book called The Final Quest. Anybody ever read it? Like Rick Joyner or something like that. It's not a theology book. It's more like an allegory. But anyway, it's like spiritual warfare stuff. And it was talking about this great army that stood on a battlefield, right? They were up on a hill and they had had an encounter with God. And so their armor just shone so bright. So bright that, that as this soldier was getting ready to walk out, wisdom grabbed him by the armor and pulled him back and said, hey, look over there. And they were trying to look and they couldn't see anything. Like, wisdom, I can't see. I don't know what's happening over there. And he said, here, put this on. It was this like, you know how sometimes with armor, people would put something over it, like a, like a standard, if you would, where it would cover the armor. This was kind of drabby. It was like a drab. It was called the drab of humility. He said, put this on your armor. And as soon as he put it on, the, the glare of his armor went away, and he could see the enemy waiting in wait, lying in wait to the, to the right, waiting to sabotage the army that ran out. And as he stood there, he watched these, these warriors who didn't put it on run out and just get picked off by these arrows. But the thing was, because their armor was shining so bright, they didn't even feel the arrows. They just started bleeding. And then they started thinking, I don't even need it. They started throwing down their weapons and they took off their armor and the enemy destroyed them. That's our problem. We love success. It's good to have those moments of success. But like I tell people in our treatment center, success is dangerous. It's more dangerous at times than failure because you stop looking for the, for the things ready to take you out. You start believing in your ability compared to what God has done. We need to put on that dependence on God. We need to consistently put on humility. If we're going to follow God and do what he's called us to do, I believe we're going to see some good things happen here. But we got to stay in a place of humility and dependence where we go, God, this was you and not us. We just did what you said, and we'll do whatever you say. Meaning if you took us this way and now you decide to go this way, we'll follow because when we start doing it on our own, we start believing our own success. We start drinking our own Kool-Aid and believing we got some secret. We have no secret. It's, it's him. I've got to follow wherever he leads. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, uh, I pray now for those struggling. Pray for those that are going through a hard time that need endurance. God, help them with that. Give them the, the ability to sustain, to keep holding on, to keep moving forward. I pray for those that, that need to obey, that you've spoken to them and you've given them clear directive of where they're supposed to step out. Pray you give them the courage to step out. I pray for those that struggle with their faith that they would trust more in the who than the how. They would put it in you. Pray for those that are facing scary situations that you would give them courage. But I pray most this morning for those that are winning. Pray for those that have some success in their life. Because I know my enemy and I know his methods and I know what he's doing. He'll get you to believe that you got it. 
God, would you just help us to put our dependence back on you, to, to turn back to you and to say, God, my, my success, my victory, my overcoming, all of that has to do with you. And I remind myself daily that apart from you, I can do nothing. It's in you, as Paul said, that I live and I move and I have my being. It's in you. It's in you. So, God, I pray. Father, I pray right now as a church that if we have tried to move into our own power, our own strength, our own anointing, our own systems, our own programs, God, that we come back to you and we say, just like you did when we started this place, we need you to guide. We need you to lead. We need you to direct. We don't want systems or strategies or schemes. We don't want to build this by man. We want this to be be divinely inspired, God-led, God-breathed, because that's where lives are changed. We just give it back to you right now. Pray for those people that may have, have been experiencing some success in their life, that, that this would just be a, a quick Holy Spirit reminder that, that it's in you. Jesus, I thank you so much for these moments of clarity, for these moments of, of, of the love that you have for us. The Father, the Bible says, as a son, the Father loves us as his children, and whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, even as a son or a daughter in whom he delights. I believe this word is one of those words that just is to quickly remind us that we, we watch too many great men and women of God fall. And I don't believe they fall because they get into some grotesque. I think they let the pride and their success blind them. Help us to consistently be a people that return to humility. The Bible says, God, you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. I need a lot of grace because I do a lot of dumb things, which means I need to be really humble. And I want to humble myself. I don't want you to humble me. That hurts a lot. I don't want you to have to humble me. I want to consistently be in a place where I humble myself before you. We need you, God. We desperately need you. I thank you for every person that you brought in this place today. I pray the words that you've spoken are yours and they will go deep into hearts and bear truth and fruit that will last and remain. Jesus, now help us as we move into these next six days that we will live our life in such a way to reflect you to reflect your glory. But I pray we wake up in the morning, God, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? How do you want us to live? That we will be obedient to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless, man. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you next week.